Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Shearholtz from NASA's Office of Communications, and we're here today at NASA's Kennedy Space Center to talk with scientists and researchers about the important studies they will be conducting aboard the International Space Station in microgravity. Tomorrow at 4.33 p.m. Eastern Time, SpaceX will launch its sixth commercial resupply services mission to the International Space Station. It will carry more than 4,300 pounds of supplies and payloads, including critical materials to support about 40 of the 250 experiments and investigations that will take place during expeditions 43 and 44. Here to talk with us today about some of those science investigations are Dr. Kirk Costello, International Space Station Deputy Chief Scientist at NASA's Johnson Space Center, Dr. Mike Roberts, Senior Research Pathway Manager for the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, known as CASIS, Dr. Paul Reichert, Principal Investigator for Protein Crystal Growth 3 for Merck Research Laboratories, and Dr. Lenore Rasmussen, Principal Investigator for the Synthetic Muscle for Prosthetics and Robotics Investigation from RAS Labs. Our intent today is to enable a discussion, so we'll take questions throughout. If you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand, get my attention. Uh, we'll start with both Dr. Costello and Dr. Roberts talking about the partnership between NASA and the International Space Station and CASIS and the National Laboratory. So um, can you tell us a little bit about National Lab and the Space Station Program's goal in developing this relationship with CASIS? Sure. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, in 2005, Congress designated the ISS as a national laboratory. The purpose of doing so was to make those resources available to our nation's researchers, not just anymore to do research to better uh, the understanding of how we explore our universe and human exploration in space, but also to enable research that really does pay benefits for the human earthbound citizen. So with that in mind, NASA and CASIS have two different goals, but we're utilizing the same laboratory space. Um, CASIS is the manager for the national lab, and as such, they manage all of the research projects that really have as their main objective bettering our lives here on Earth. And what types of research can we do in space to really benefit humans on Earth? That's a great question. So in space, Particularly in low Earth orbit, we have microgravity, a microgravity environment. In a microgravity environment, there is no convection-driven buoyancy forces. Uh, that means fluids behave very differently. Uh, that different behavior affects all fluidic systems, whether those are material science type investigations we're doing, and uh, we want to see things not sediment out or develop more slowly over time as in protein crystallography and, and crystallization, or uh, human systems, cellular systems, how it affects our biology. Those are two great uses that can translate to our human benefits back here on Earth, whether we're looking at various disease vectors and how they respond different, differently in space and identifying new pathways to attack those, or looking at material science type investigations to develop new materials for uh, production back here on Earth. We also have exposure to the space environment, and that capability allows us to launch CubeSats and other small payloads uh, to do te technology development and, again, to look at the Earth and provide that return Earth imaging for us. And Dr. Roberts, we've been discussing a couple of cases payloads already. We'll, we'll be discussing two more. Can you talk to us about how these studies get selected and how long it takes? Uh, certainly, Stephanie. So as, as Dr. Costello mentioned, you know, CASIS' perspective is slightly different than that of NASA in utilizing the International Space Station National Lab. We like to look at it as the International Space Station is, is one destination, but we have many uses for it. And in the case of CASIS, our selection process is based on identifying research and technology development that translates the benefit here on Earth. NASA continues to fund and support research investigations along that line, but they also use the International Space Station as a launching off point to go further into space. CASIS, however, focuses directly on benefit here on Earth. So in selecting payloads that have access to that, our goal at CASIS is to increase the ability 
of researchers here in the United States to utilize the International Space Station as a national lab. And in doing that, our focus is in reaching out to new to space investigators as well as established investigators from academic schools, from research universities, from commercial interest, and from other government agencies. And you're going to hear shortly examples from a couple of different commercial entities who are interested in, can, in one case, continuing to use the International Space Station as a research and environment, and another case from a company that's new to space that perhaps had not considered the use of space as an active research environment until the International Space Station was designated a national lab. In order to fulfill our promise to the United States to increase utilization of the International Space Station and manage effectively the resources on board the International Space Station National Lab, we have a selection process. So proposals to utilize the International Space Station National Lab can come to CASIS through either solicited avenues where we identify particular areas of research we want to support or through unsolicited pathways where you as an investigator identify a particular area of research or technology development that you believe could benefit from exposure to the unique environment on board the International Space Station. Uh, great. Do we have questions from the group? Here you go. Lane Herman, um, spaceheadnews.com. Uh, I was wondering, um, there's always been concern about the supplies and uh, having the space station fully supplied. Uh, we're setting up on this mission, uh, the trunk is, uh, that's unpressurized on uh, CRS-6 is empty. I was uh, wondering if uh, there was any comment on that. Sure, uh, that's a very good question, great observation. But we're actually flying the trunk empty on this flight in, eight, in order to enable more science on board. And the, the reason behind that is we have a national lab investigation called Rodent Research 2. And during this investigation will be, uh, uh, there's a follow-on investigation for Novartis that CASIS is, is managing. And this investigation requires a significant amount of crew time. Uh, when we did have plans to uh, fly a payload in the trunk, that payload would have taken significant amounts of time to install on orbit as part of our international docking adapter system. So instead, uh, the program manager made a uh, command decision to move that payload to the next SpaceX mission, and we are able to dedicate that crew time now to conducting the rodent research, which of course has very tight time controls on when those operations occur on orbit. I think there was another question here. Uh, Jim Siegel, I'm with the Celebration News and with Space Flight Insider. I have a question about uh, the fact that Congress has designated uh, the ISS as a a national laboratory. So what are the implications of that? Does that mean that uh, there's more funding or that there's more access to it? Or So what does the average person, uh, why should that be important? Uh, thank you. That's a very good question. And the answer to both of those is yes. Um, <laughs> CASIS was created with funding annual funding provided by NASA. The intent, though, is to wean ourselves off of that funding as we mature as an organization. And part of that is going out to industry to increase interest in the use of the International Space Station as a national laboratory. As I'm sure most of the audience is familiar, national labs are a designation given to several labs across the United States primarily operated by contractors supporting the Department of Energy or Department of Defense. In that case, the International Space Station is operating in a similar way as a national lab. The national labs were created to support research and technology development, not only for government researchers, but for academic researchers and commercial researchers who needed access to unique aspects, usually equipment or facilities that were too expensive to maintain for certain operations there. In that case, the International Space Station represents a very unique, uh, a unique environment, a unique platform that has been accessible to other government agencies and commercial investigators prior to the existence of the International Space Station, even on the space shuttle. But it was primarily PI-driven hypothesis testing, and it was sometimes difficult for researchers from other government agencies to develop their research in a timely manner in order to utilize that, those unique aspects of that environment. 
with the designation of the International Space Station as a national lab, there are new pathways that are opened. And with the selection of CASIS as a 501c3, we are a nonprofit organization, we can interact with business, with industry, with other government agencies in ways that NASA could not previously. So the goal is to build the ability to utilize the station by leveraging the funding that NASA has invested, that we as taxpayers have invested in NASA to create the International Space Station and to build an even larger research and technology development portfolio by utilizing funding provided by industry and directly from other government agencies. For example, one of the investigations on this particular mission is funded primarily by the National Institutes of Health. And that investigation is sponsored by CASIS, but involves significant funding not only from NASA and CASIS, but also from the National Institutes of Health to the primary investigator. And that's a type of model that will be built upon by other government agencies as we move forward, including the Department of Defense, National Science Foundation, and other institutes within the National Institutes of Health. Ken had a question. Hi, Ken Kramer for America Space and Universe today. I just want to follow up a little bit on on Mark's question. Actually, the, the payload, if I'm not mistaken, on this on this uh, flight is a little bit less. I think on the last CRS flight and the previous, there was about five thousand pounds. This is about forty three hundred pounds. So, as you don't have anything in the trunk, I, I'm wondering since you didn't put anything in there, first, why is the the weight less, and and uh, were you able to pack more into the Dragon capsule itself since you did not put anything um, in, in, into the trunk? Thanks. Okay. Uh, that's an interesting question. Of, of course, uh, mass is not the only measure uh, when you talk about installing cargo in a pressurized vehicle. It's also a volumetric challenge. So um, depending on the type of uh, equipment resupplies, cargo, uh, science we're bringing to station, you get a different volume. And in this case, we've volumed out before we've hit our mass limits for, for the SpaceX. Uh, in this case, though, we are resupplying the space station with a large amount of uh, crew resupply, uh, water, and uh, other items that the crew need to live and breathe on the space station. And a large amount of science payload. Um, that, that science payload is supporting around 40 of the investigations, uh, the 95 new investigations that we have this increment. Uh, and that's, that's a significant contribution for us. Again, the, the SpaceX is the only vehicle that provides us a down mass capability as well. So we're looking forward to this SpaceX, this Dragon capsule docking, so that we can not only conduct the research that it has on board, but return those samples while they're still viable. There's a question here. Hi, Michael Doherty from the Safe Sci-Fi Facebook page, Facebook page with, here with the NASA Social. Um, before we get into, into any more very specifics, I did want to ask a general question about the space station and the experiments done on it by CASIS and NASA in general. Um, you, know, we have, you guys have some amazing experiments that are going to hopefully help solve a lot of you know, problems climate-wise, disease-wise, and in other ways. What about the fact that this ISS is being supposedly decommissioned in 2020? What are the plans after that? Because how are you guys going to be doing those experiments in microgravity without the space station in orbit? Okay. Um, first off, the ISS was extended to operate through 2024. Uh, by the president er earlier last year. And uh, we are still gathering our international partners' cooperation to extend that date officially out to 2024 with the whole partnership. Um, so we do have a little bit longer on the clock right now to go ahead and start, you know, really returning the investment of the American public in the science and the type of research that we can conduct on board. Uh, there are ho hopes to go out further. Uh, and to extend that again, but for right now, we are extended through 2024. Yeah, and from Case's perspective, I'd just like to add that, you know, it's, it's a platform unlike any other. It's a unique national lab within our constellation of national labs across the United States. And there has been a considerable investment from the U.S. taxpayer as well as the international partners in building that. So we are truly in the age of utilization of the International Space Station now, and it's only the beginning. We're seeking as, as an organization to 
create more demand than we can possibly support. And then from that, hopefully that will lead to further development of the next space station or improvement in existing capabilities on this space station. The idea is to take it from this point and move forward and get the best science returned from it that we can. And I think we're making great progress in that arena already. Is there a question here? And that leads directly to the question I wanted to ask is with the designation of the space station as a national laboratory, how does that affect the fact that it is an international space station? Well, technically, the, the national laboratory designation means that those resources, which are USOS resources for NASA, uh, gets, get shared between the CASIS research that's selected and the NASA research that's selected. Our international partners have rights to certain portions or allocations of the research capability of the station, and they maintain those. Uh, but between the national lab science that's selected and the NASA science that's selected, we share our resources. Uh, we're also working very hard to collaborate with our international partners on more and more investigations to conduct international research and to collaborate where appropriate between the NASA science program and the CASES science program. James? Uh, thanks. James Dean, Florida Today. Dr. Costello, I just want to follow up on your comment about uh, rodent research, too, um, requiring more time. I was just wondering if you could discuss a little more about what's different from this rodent flight from the last one. I was just trying to look it up quickly, and there's reference to dissection of the rodents, and I was wondering if that's something, is that something the astronauts are actually going to have to do, and if so, is that, would that be a first? Um, that is true. The astronauts do dissect the animals uh, at the end of the investigation. That is not a first on orbit. It was conducted during the first rodent research mission as well. What is new to operations in this investigation are that the astronauts will also be doing uh, DEXA bone densitometry studies on the rodents. So uh, as part of the investigation, the animals will be taken out and x-rayed for bone density and then returned to the habitat before they're uh, dissected. And if I could add, that's a time course study. This is an investigation that's sponsored by CASES for one of our commercial customers, Novartis Institutes of Biomedical Research in, in Cambridge in Boston. And their interest is in looking at a longitudinal study. So they're going to be able to collect data from the mice with cumulative exposure to the microgravity environment on board station. So they're actually going to be able to perform DEXA scans, these bone densitometry scans, in mice as they age upon uh, in, in exposure to the microgravity environment. So they'll be taking readings of loss of bone mineral density in these mice and muscle atrophy as they're exposed to the space environment for longer periods of time. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, great. So we'll move on to Dr. Paul Reichert, who it has the Protein Crystal Growth 3 study. He's an experienced space researcher who had investigations flown on 11 space shuttle missions as well. So can you tell us a little bit about how your experiments vary from other protein crystal growth experiments? I think most uh, previous uh, protein crystal growth experiments, the main focus was on getting large single crystals for structure. Um, where we differ in what we're doing in Merck research laboratories is we're interested in looking at two of our investigational medicines and a new class of drugs known as biologics, which have its own unique problems. And we're hoping that using the U.S. National Lab, we can take advantage of, of uh, not only the weightlessness, you know, uh, taking advantage of that these crystals as they grow, they will not sediment. Uh, we'd also like to take advantage of the fact that there's a uniform temperature environment as well as hopefully that the molecules will move slowly and the crystals, the molecules that are incorporated in these crystals uh, will be more uniform, more uh, pure. Um, these uh, two investigational drugs uh, are for cancer indications um, and we're hoping that we can make uh, more pure, uh, larger and more uniform particles that we can use for drug delivery uh, for manufacture and in uh, product development. Uh, we do this uh, to benefit uh, the delivery of our, our products to our patients and something that people forget about is the caretakers. 
because with cancer, a large part of, uh, of uh, the problems with cancer fall on caretakers. So if you can come up with a better uh, medications that could be delivered uh, in a uh, doctor's office rather than in a hospital setting, that has a significant impact um, on uh, the uh, delivery, the ease of administration, uh, the adherence to taking medication, and the compliance uh, in taking these medications. Questions? Uh, Jim Siegel again from the Celebration News and from Space Flight uh, Insider. Uh, I'm interested in uh, exa exactly how you go from the crystal experiments that you're describing, the protein crystals, to a delivery system. Can you describe how that would work? What kind of delivery system are you talking about and so on? I think the best example. No, no, it's not. It's not pr proprietary at all. It's something that's been used for 60 years. People have been injecting insulin, uh, you know, uh, crystalline suspensions, uh, basically porcine insulin for about 60 years now. And it, wasn't, it hasn't been too recently where the pharmaceutical industry, which has been going through its own changes, we now consider ourselves biopharmaceutical companies. And there's a whole new class of drugs, biologics, that there's a real problem delivering them. They can only be given in hospital uh, uh, settings as a constant infusion where a patient has to spend six hours getting an infusion. Um, and uh, I would love to see an opportunity to come up with a, uh, a crystalline suspension that you could take as a single sub-Q injection that you could either administer yourself or in a doctor's office. Uh, to me, that would have a significant impact on the ease of administration and the, and the comfort of patients. and takes a tremendous load off caregivers who are probably responsible for driving that patient back and forth to uh, hospitals. And, uh, and the, uh, the constant infusion basically is about half the cost of administering the drug. So it has a significant uh, financial benefit to it as well. Stuart Money, Interspace.net. And my question is, do you foresee a, a short jump towards industrial level manufacture of these types of proteins in zero G or is this a, a, a research to find a better way to do it on earth? I, I know this is something that was put forward decades ago as, as this was going to be the, the industrial key to, to space. It sounds like you're a lot closer, but could you address that? I, I, I love that question because I, I, we, you know, uh, years ago that was the goal of our space shuttle you know, missions was be able to do it in the scale uh, that you can do manufacturing in space. For that product, which was alpha interferon, it was possible because the actual dose was nanograms, very small amounts of per dose. Uh, the new class of biologics, monoclonal antibodies, fortunately you have to give milligrams, so a bigger. So I think it's still possible. It would just take a lot more research uh, to do that. Uh, but that, personally, that's one of the things that I'd, I would love to see. However, uh, you know, our goal, immediate goal, is to learn, is to produce unique uh, crystalline suspensions that we can't on Earth. Um, and we did that in my previous work. We were able to, uh, actually by accident, produce a, a uniform crystalline suspension uh, that was so good that we used it for two years in primate studies. So it moved our, our research ability to, to investigate uh, delivery of this uh, product much earlier. Two years we saved in cycle by doing that. So. Mark Gotch, Historical Imagery Canada. Could you tell me, uh, how has this crystalline experimentation differed from that done on Earth in the space station in terms of what different types of crystals has this yielded? Um, the, uh, to date, uh, on CRS-3, we're able to get larger crystals. Um, and the, the, those studies were very limited in the uh, amount of protein that we're trying to crystallize. In this experiment, our goal is to produce a lot of crystals. And we're doing it under conditions 
that we have enough now to look at it for purification, for particle size uh, uh, distribution, um, and uh, for different for how it differs from the ground-based experiment. Um, I'm really looking forward to see what we get. I have a, uh, based on my previous shuttle experiments, I have, uh, a, I have a pretty good idea how things are going to work out. So I'm pretty excited about having this opportunity uh, to fly uh, again. Question here. Val Phillips, uh, Zero G News. Uh, you've mentioned, obviously, you've run experiments on shuttle. Um, what's the, have there been better benefits from running on shuttle compared to ISS? Um, what's the differences? And how long is this experiment going to be running on ISS? Um, we're going to be up for, this is a sortie mission for us, so it'll be up. It'll <laughs> come, our experiment will come off Dragon. You go into the U.S. Uh, National Lab, actually in an incubator. Um, for we're hoping for up to 18 days um, and then it comes back and then we'll be able to uh, do our characterization studies. Um, we always do a comparable ground experiment in the exact flight hardware that we're running so we have a good baseline of what actually we gain from the uh, microgravity experiment. Um, I, I, I think that the real advantage that uh, I have to say is cases. Um, we were able to, to, when they approached us two years ago uh, with the opportunity to do microgravity uh, crystallization again, uh, they, uh, in a very quickly, we were able to come up with a proposal uh, where the, you know, the primary benefit had to be uh, to human health. And uh, within six months, we, we had a plan. Um, I think what helped tremendously is that uh, at Merck, we already had experience with the certified hardware. Um, I think it's a disadvantage to investigators who are unfamiliar with what the available flight certified hardware is and adapting to that, to that hardware. I think that's a, that's a significant problem for researchers. Uh, there is a significant difference between how you set up your experiment on Earth and then transferring that into the limitations that you have, time, space, and the hardware that you have to deal with in doing your experiments um, in space in the microgravity. I think that's the, from my perspective, that's the biggest challenge that you, that you have. Uh, and uh, you know, that, that's also the most exciting part. What can I do? I'm given this box, I'm given this opportunity, what can I, how much can I, you know, do to take advantage of that, you know? Um, and then designing it such that the experiment will, will, the crystallization will take place within that 18 day uh, time frame. Um, and that the crystals that we get back don't degrade um, during that process and bring them back. Um, I'm laughing somewhat because usually the question I get all the time was, well, don't these crystals crack? Doesn't this, you know, the, the fact that your crystals come back, don't they destroy them? And I love that question because the crystals that we grow, these protein crystals that we grow, are actually like uh, jello. They're actually, they're, they're very soft and they're floating in this, you know, body of, of liquid mm -hmm. and they're actually cushioned, you know, um, and uh, on, uh, unfortunately, I should say that on SDS, uh, 107, we had a crystallization experiment. In spite of the catastrophic events, we did recover uh, crystals from that. So I use that as an example of how, you know, uh, durable these crystals are, and it's mostly due to being cushioned in the in the in the solution that they're growing in. And uh, Jello is a good thing. So. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to Dr. Rasmussen uh, and the synthetic muscle for pros prosthetics and robotics investigation, which is looking at material that contracts and expands like a muscle. This is fascinating. How does it work? Um, my materials, uh, electroactive polymers, uh, are in a class of materials called smart materials. Smart materials respond to 
stimuli. It can be light, you know, like a transition lens. It can be a lot of different um, things. And in the case of electroactive polymers, the stimulus is electricity. My um, electroactive polymers, I'm just going to call them EAPs, uh, respond to electricity by contraction. Then when I reverse the polarity, make the positive negative and the negative positive, um, I can get expansion. I can control that. Um, and my linear range tends to be low, between zero and 50 volts, um, with a low noise and heat signature as well. The uh, interesting thing about these materials is, uh, in my case, I'm very interested in, um, this is partly why I developed this, this class of materials, I'm very interested in prosthetics, realistic prosthetics, particularly for the hand and arm. So I've developed materials that um, basically contract and expand, so they look act and even feel um, very much like human tissue. Um, when they're activated by electricity, there is a little bit of residual resistance, so they even feel warm to the touch. That said, I'm very early stage. I am a high-tech early stage um, startup company. Um, my corporate experience is Johnson & Johnson. I have uh, my PhD is synthetic polymer chemistry. Um, then I have a master's in biophysics. Um, but what what I've no, what's kind of been a pleasant surprise for me is I'm receiving a lot of attention also from the robotics community because human-like grasp would be very, very useful. And how um, I ended up meeting cases actually was through the, the, the global uh, business accelerator called Mass Challenge. I was one of the global finalists in 2013. What I had done in the past is I had actually put uh, my materials through extreme temperature experiments. And um, there was a thought that if they were radiation resistant, in this class of materials, the methacoate family, um, does tend to lend itself to radiation resistance. There was some thoughts that that could be used kind of dual purpose for both uh, space exploration and for uh, robotics on Earth. Because often where you really, really need a robot is um, where you can't put a human and you wouldn't even want to put a dog. So. The, uh, so what we're doing with the uh, ISS is it's a unique radiation um, environment because once you get above our atmosphere, not only our atmosphere, but our whole um, planet diffuses around it a lot of the electromagnetism electromagnet um, from the sun in particular. Once you get even at low orbital, you're getting a lot of not only solar but cosmic radiation effects. So, um, and I applaud cases, not only for um, the, the, the taking the advances we've learned from space and applying them to Earth, but also f from their insights for this whole process for me, because I am one of the new investigators um, on the ISS, and being adaptable as the process went along. These materials, this is just a mock-up, this is a prototype of, and it's a matrix of eight samples. There's four of these matrices going up onto the ISS, and then four, not this one, because it has gone through the airport and stuff, but four remaining at home as controls, kind of like the twin experiment, <laughs> up there and down here. And, um, and of these four spots, and you can come up and feel afterwards, they're one by one, kind of roughly one inch by one inch squares of synthetic muscle, where this first spot has zero additives, zero coatings. The next two, kind of mini experiment with an experiment, um, has some additives. The next one has a coating taken from the spacesuit technology, um, so it's a mylar coating. The next two coatings are actually from the U.S. Army, from their MRE, or Meals Ready to Eat program, because my materials, just like human muscle, operate best moist. Um, so I'm very interested in coating these once I get out of naval or watery environments onto land um, applications. And then the last two spots are combinations of the additives to enhance the radiation resistance and um, some of the, to, the, the army coatings. The, um, what I applied cases for is what we found out last summer when we exposed a similar matrix, um, similar matrices, um, and also just bulk materials to, uh, to one of their gamma radiation um, sources at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, which is a U.S. Department of Energy federal lab. Um, 
they held up very, very well. Selected samples, and plus we learned a lot just from the matrices of the additives and coatings. So well, in fact, that the original plan on the ISS was for a 30-day exposure up and down, but we're extending it to 90 days. So on Monday, it'll be going up on a SpaceX, and then it'll be returning on the SpaceX 7 mid-July. And um, so it's, it, we're, I'm just thrilled um, that, that this is going to be tested um, in such a unique environment. Because you can test for radiation on Earth for beta, for gamma, for alpha, for things, very damaging things um, in space. You run into things called high energy linear, high LET particles. You can do specific tests on Earth. You can even uh, use a particle accelerator for the, to, to kind of mimic the high LET particles. But once you get up in space, you have a lot of things going in all at once, from the cosmos, from the sun. You also have that whole range of the electromagnetic spectrum. You have your ionizing X-ray technology. It's a unique environment. And so um, I'm, I'm really um, interested to see how it holds up in that particular environment. But we did hit it very, very hard here on Earth um, last summer at Princeton. And some of the coatings, I just wanted to, because this is so cool. Um, some of the coatings, again, it's US Army from their Meals Ready to Eat. And this is a new coating that's been developed for them. And it looks clear. But it actually does have an aluminum coating just like this one, but it's at a nanoscale. So the aluminum coating is there, but they're such small particles that our eyes, because they're smaller than the visible spectrum, can't detect it. And these have been tested on Earth also, I mean, independently by US Army, and held up also very well to radiation. So they're kind of being, um, to see if they could even enhance and protect my materials a little better than not being coated. So that was, that's my plug. And I I'm sure we have questions. It. Questions? <laughs> Uh, Carl Rasmussen of the Hingham Public Schools. The main thing I was wondering is your interest in prosthetics, and I was wondering how a user would control the prosthetic, like physically. Um, that's a good question. For the prosthetics, we're looking at the market two ways. One is its simple shape morphine abilities. It gets bigger and smaller with the electric impulse. So for the prosthetic liner socket, where it attaches, we're looking at contracting it so that it can be easily worn and then it can shape more for fill during the course of the day to maintain a very comfortable um, fit so that the patient or the amputee is not having to fool with it, mess it, it can kind of conform um, with the patient as he goes about his or her daily life. And our limbs, all of our limbs do change, um, not even in weeks, months, years, but even the course of day. We change roughly a shoe size between morning and night. My big interest in developing those was linked actuation, where this is two links and this is a simple hinge joint. And um, I've begun researching that. It is a, it's, it's very early stage, but it's working. There's another question right there. Morgan Turner from NASA Social. Um, let me just begin by saying this is really interesting to me, um, especially uh, when how you're dealing with the, the, the effects of radiation on your materials. Um, I wanted to ask you, the purpose of this experiment is to see how it holds up in space, right? How uh, the rate of deterioration uh, of, your, of your material or whether or not it does deteriorate um, when exposed to radiation. What I wanted to ask is, do you think it's possible that you could use your material uh, for future astronaut clothing, like in, inside as a protective layer? Actually, that's a very good question, and one thing we um, are very much interested with space exploration, not just my materials, but robotics in general, is human assist. And with human assist, it does have to be comfortable. It has to be, it can't be so strong it hurts the human interacting with it. So this is a very gentle approach to helping the astronaut with whatever they're trying to do to do very human-like um, grasp and then a glove and something that, that is a potential application is as an assist kind of exoskeleton type application, yes. I think there was another question way in the back. Yes, my name is Gina Clifford with NASA Social. And I'm not, I'm not sure if this question is exactly what you're describing, but I, I honestly want to know, would you consider this technology 
um, similar or maybe even equivalent to self-assembly or self-replicating structures when you add energy to a material and to get it to do something from the material perspective? Yeah, this, this material, at least right now, as it, it's designing, is not self-assembled, but I am working on um, the material science of it, so it can be what's called self-healing. Um, some good results, but um, but for the self-assembly, it's not exactly self-assembled, but there are some analogies. As we work with architecture, though, particularly as we miniaturize, that could come into play because we are looking at going smaller and, and very interested in nanotech technology in this area. Uh, there's a question here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, Courtney Peterson with NASA Social. My question is, is, are there any other applications for the radio or the radiation material in protecting um, maybe cancer patients uh, that are getting radiation, maybe laying this on them so it's not maybe impacting other parts of their body? Is there any other application other than what you're using right now? Um, actually, it's not an application I th have thought of, but some of the additives um, are used to kind of mitigate radiation effects. Part of what goes on um, with high radiation effects is even in a moist environment, and like I said, a lot of these are watery. It affects our human tissues as well. So you get um, the, uh, the, the peroxide formation, which can cause um, cellular damage, or I was worried about material damage. So I actually, some of the additives have a very strong free radical um, inhibitor properties. So potentially that could be an application. It doesn't necessarily need to be electroactive, but some of that additive type technology in a moist matrix could be useful. Question here. Mark Gotch, Historical Imagery Canada. Could you tell me, uh, in your experimentation hopes with this synthetic muscle mass, would you expect it to have much different properties in space? And if those properties were to be, let's say, better than that on Earth, how would you expect, expect to replicate those properties here back on Earth? Do you mean in terms of motion, material science, or a little bit of both? Expansion and contraction that oh. you are, are seeking. Yes. Actually, just one thing that excites me about space um, is that you don't have the uh, as much of the resistance via, via gravity, you know, or, or you know, air kind of a thing. And with the microenvironment, I expect it to work obviously just like we work better uh, in space than on Earth because a little bit of force gets gets a lot of motion because there's no dr a very little drag down um, from that. So I'm expecting it. When I get to the point of exploring, this is a static experiment based on, you know, um, material science. When I get to the point, though, of putting a little battery pack and having it do motion, I expect it to just like the astronauts found when they throw something that, you know, they can use a little bit of force to get it to shoot that basket. <laughs> um, how will that apply to Earth? Actually, what's interesting is because this does expand and contract in the XYZ direction through an osmotic flow of the solvent. Um, the neat thing in space is that's a pure environment. It, 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 the microgravity is basically in the XY direction is very pure, and we're actually interested in the fluid dynamics of this phenomena. And that type of exploration would be, as a scientist, would be marvelous because you don't have the artifacts, if you will. Um, you have like a pure XYZ direction expansion without that slowdown from gravity and other effects. Ken? Ken Kramer, American Space and Universe Today. I'm curious, could this have any application in the robot that's already there, and maybe especially on the exterior uh, version of the robot, robot uh, increasing its dexterity? And could it have application also in Mars rovers, manipulating samples to get the samples um, collected and analyzed by the uh, analytical instruments? Thanks. Um, I am hoping it will be useful for space robots and the amount of radiation, at least in terms of gamma, that we hit with it um, at Princeton last summer at the Princeton Physics Lab was uh, one, one experiment was the equivalent of Mars and back. The next experiment was Jupiter and beyond. 
um, just in terms of gamma. There's a lot of other stuff going up there, but that is our hope is to um, augment with lifelike robotics, the space program, and I would love to put my stuff on Mars. <laughs> I have a space junkie. So. Have you given any thought uh, with regards to prosthetics as to how this material might interact with uh, human biology? Yes, but not um, at this point, not as a, um, at this point we're going for external devices. We partly because of FDA compliance issues. That would be further down the road when, uh, f as far as uh, going subdermal. So I do have some thoughts, but that's further down the road. Right now we're focusing more on the external class one devices. Question here. Josh Evans with NASA Social. I've heard you mention applications to um, possibly protective layers also for external layering on space robots. Do you think that there's any application for um, a device that would amplify the ability of astronauts or other humans to increase their strength and dexterity as they're operating using a device that's connected to them using these materials? Yes, um, partly to help, but also, and this gets more time perhaps military applications, but also space or applications where you see something you want to explore, but you may want not to want to risk your hand putting it there. So yes, we have some thoughts on that. So. Val Phillips, Zero G News. Um, as a first time participant, um, having something put up into space, would you possibly explain a bit more about the process for someone else who has, you know, probably has a dream, but doesn't know how possibly to get to to where you are now? Um, yes, I w my first thing once you engage is to be patient. Um, my uh, internal goal for this uh, payload was um, I was trying to hit the October um, orbital launch, and was kind of bummed earlier in, in that October because it's like, oh, I wish mine was going <laughs> up. And then, like a lot, uh, many of us, um, it was a tra tragic that, I mean, no, I, I'm glad nobody was hurt or harmed, but all that effort that, you know, just disappeared. Um, so then I was like, thank goodness I totally underestimated how much paperwork <laughs> is involved dealing with, with NASA. But I would say to um, continue to engage with whether it's cases, whether it's NASA, you know, with whatever your vehicle, um, realize it's gonna be a long process to be patient to and, and to engage with them, particularly if you don't know something or if you are getting like a little frustrated, to kind of keep that communication going and, and, and push if you need to. And, um, but uh, all of us at RAS Labs, we've been doing like Vulcan high fives and stuff because we are all space junkie. Anybody remotely um, affiliated with robotic, ro robots tends to be really into space. It's, it's interesting to note too that uh, uh, you mentioned the Orbital 3 mishap and, and the difficulty we had in losing many of those payloads. But many of those payloads are coming back. For instance, one of the investigations, Meteor, uh, is a CASIS National Lab investigation that was originally on the Orbital 3. It was lost, and we, we are now reflying the spare to orbit. And I would add there were several educational payloads on Orb 3 that have already reflown. They've already been up to station and back. So I, I would use that as an indication of the new responsiveness of NASA. And that's part of CASIS's mission, too. NASA is, is very supportive of CASIS's efforts to go out and build this as a, as a usable platform for a variety of, of different users. And in doing that, NASA is working very hard to make sure that the facilities and the timelines from the time you're in contact with someone to sponsor your payload until the time you fly, that that time is shortened. And that enables especially startups where time is very precious, mm -hmm. funding is very precious. You can't be waiting around either for your funding to come through the door or for you to get the results you need in order to move to the next step. And that's where in order to realize the value of the National Lab, a lot of investment has been made in, from a resource standpoint to enable investigators to get to space faster. And then whether their investigation works or not, they have the opportunity to take what they've learned and apply it to another flight mission within a reasonable amount of time. Hi, um, Michael Doherty here. Um, one of my 
fellow page admins on Facebook has a question for you about your material. He was hoping to know if it could be used as you know as a covering on say a robotic arm that would then when picking an object up could it help differentiate between textures and such at some point and transmit that information back to the astronaut using it. Ah, could it be a sensor, in effect, and perhaps, and even prosthetics, our interest is biofeedback. Um, potentially, yes, in that I'm not an electrical engineer, so you'll have to bear with me, but what I have noticed with my materials is when they're compressed, even mechanically compressed versus relaxed, they have a different electrical impedance that can flow through them, so that could be taken into account. Um, and this is conceptual, but this is something we, we've actually had some, some actually very in-depth discussions with parties about. Um, it could potentially not only be your electroactive polymer doing the motion, doing the lifelike or what's also called biomimetic motion, but could pack perhaps um, with the controls in place also have a dual use as a sensate or a sensor. And then in the prosthetics industry, that would be wonderful to tie in with the, you know, the biofeedback. So. Another question in the front row. Uh, Stuart Money, interspace.net. Again, and my question is for Mike and, and maybe for both of you too as well. Could you address the intellectual property um, benefits of, of working with cases? I mean, that's got to be a, a major component of a corporation's decision to to put the kind of resources into it, sort of the guarantees and, and what it's, what, what is that environment from a, from a business standpoint? I'll, I'll handle that. I think going into this, we basically said the emphasis should be on publishing and, and not worry about the uh, IP. And the general agreement is, is that the research that we do, we're going to offer to the broader research community. Uh, that, that's what we went in from our perspective going into this. Um, and that's, you know, that's how we handle it, Merck. Okay, for, for a small startup, high tech, um, IP is our bread and butter. It is what we are. So that was one thing I, I did have my um, patent attorney vet. And, um, but actually the, the, the CASIS project was very respectful of um, RAS Labs IP. And uh, since some of this will be um, very kind of theor theoretical as well, that's what I tend to do is publish theory public and theory, and uh, patent formulations and actuations. So um, so I've kind of, I, I split my business into kind of two hats, if you will, but Cases has, the, the, the whole uh, vehicle of it was very respectful of our company's IP. Yeah, so from Cases' perspective, it begins with the discussion, what the interests are, and the return on investment that we're seeking to create on the International Space Station, in some cases, that ties directly back to publishing and getting as much information available as you can out to the community. And in some cases, as, as Paul just indicated, industry is strongly behind that. In other cases, as, as Dr. Rasmussen just indicated, there needs to be protection up front for the intellectual property that comes from that. And sometimes that intellectual property protection needs to stay with the company for a very long time. In other cases, it just needs to be embargoed for a certain amount of time. So again, it all begins with a discussion about what your needs are and what you need to protect. And then there are ways to, to work forward with that. Another question here? Val Phillips, uh, Zero G News. It's actually a question about your particular experiment this time out. From my understanding, it's a dry version of your of the individual materials. But long term, it needs to be into a um, a moist solution. So, um, how will that? Isn't there going to be some kind of differential into how that is going to react with the radiation out in space? Um, yeah, that's. Or did a, I misunderstand? No, no, that's a good question. I can clarify. Um, this is just one sample, you know, one matrix, and it's all of these are moist and, and it's a little microclimate. There will be four of them. Two of them are my generation three material. Two of them are my generation, a uh, fourth generation material. So two, two. And then of each generation, one is in a moist microclimate, one is in a dry microclimate because I anticipate that I will see some differences, particularly with some of the harder um, particulate radiation between the moist and the dry, and I want to investigate that. Um, so to answer your question, um, it's a good question. It, it, it's, it's a good, you'd be great at scientific designing experiments. And what we've done is we've, done, we've, we've been able to capture um, 
four different scenarios with a different with a, you know a whole matrix that they're each going to go under um, but we're, we're covering four different scenarios which include both a moist and a dry exper experiment or microclimate so we'll be able to analyze all of that and compare it to the experiment on earth uh, Jim Siegel from the Celebration News and from uh, Space Flight Inter In Insider. A uh, question either for Dr. Costello or Dr. Roberts uh, regarding uh, getting back to the issue of uh, the ISS as a national laboratory. Uh, I'm interested in giving my readers some sort of perspective or metric or metrics regarding um, how many experiments or solutions or whatever you want to call them uh, have have come uh, have been launched or uh, been done uh, from a uh, um, from the point of view of, of benefiting mankind rather than space exploration do you measure those in missions or in experiments or and how many of those have been there have been ten a hundred a thousand roughly that's, that's a good question, and uh, the statistics bear that out in the split between the, the national lab, the, the CASIS investigations, and then the NASA investigations. Many of the NASA traditional investigations have also had Earth benefits. Uh, in the last press conference, we talked about the nutrition investigation and how that led to changes in the USDA requirements for vitamin D. Uh, so. But looking at the CASIS investigations, CASIS has been running for the past several years, three years, and, and typically in that time, 25 to, to 30 percent of the, the crew time and investigations have been specifically case investigations focused on those earth benefits and when you figure out that we've got 150 to 200 investigations each increment pair that means you've got 30 to 60 investigations probably per increment pair uh, that are really focused on those goals and then on top of all that we have the NASA investigations which are being used not only to, to help with our space exploration goals but what knowledge we do gain that benefits people the way we live down here on Earth is translated to the public. So many experiments, whatever, I mean, are we talking about hundreds since 2005 or thousands or 5,000 or can you say? Hundreds. We've, we've had over a thousand experiments to date uh, on, on the ISS from the, from the U.S. investigators and uh, we have over 1,600 publications already. So with each increment pair adding another 200, 300 investigations, we're, we're seeing that number increase steadily and very quickly. And CASIS is, is starting to fill out their allocation of 50% of the national lab resources, and, and they're coming along quickly. Yeah, so as Kurt said, ISS National Lab is, is obviously, you can tell from the timeline, predates the existence of CASIS. And what we're trying to do now is fill up our allocation that's given to us as NASA as fast as we can. And I think we're succeeding wildly there. We're starting to run up against some constraints on crew time in that we've got more customers lined up than we have crew time to support their investigations. And that's where the prioritization part comes into it. So up until the time that we get to add another crew member, we're going to continue to, to push the, the boundaries of that envelope of crew time as best we can. And its commercial crew will enable adding another crew member. So uh, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, stay tuned to NASA Television. Coming up next at 5 p.m. Eastern is our pre-launch news briefing to update the status of preparations for tomorrow's launch, which is scheduled for 4.33 p.m. Eastern time. You can follow along with our researchers and these studies in orbit online at www.nasa.gov station. And you can follow all the launch preparations for this mission at www.nasa.gov spacex.